today's presentation is an error model for pointing based on Fitts law. Um, if you read the paper compared to the last whatever presentations, this is really, really, really simple. I mean, that's one of the reasons I chose this. I was trying to read the last few papers and it all went over my head. So then let's, let's try to dial it down a bit. Um, another cool thing that I found about this paper was it's an HCI paper that we haven't ATI is a field that we haven't discussed much before, even though there are a lot of really cool things happening. Um, the, pro the paper, I chose that because it was, uh, one of the authors is my professor, Ian Scott McKenzie, one of the best props I have. If you're able to go to Europe, sit in his class, definitely worth it. Um, so, an error model based on Fitts law. The idea of, well, let's do an overview. So we will be going over Fitts law. The error model based on Fitts law, and if my presentation is too short, I might do a tap dance. So, what is Fitts law? Fitts law, to put it simply, is a mathematical model for rapid gain movements. So, it's a really simple mathematical construct for moving between point A to point B. Um, so, let's say, example, for any discrete task, let's say you have a stylus and you have two stimulus lights, and Basically, the user has to click on a target based on which light is on. What the Fitts law will give us is a mathematical model. How long will this user take to move between the targets based on the target width and uh, the amplitude of movement? So, at the very basis of Fitts law is the index of difficulty, which defines in bits uh, how difficult it is for a user to move from point A to point B. Uh, this was set up back in 1954, has been around since then. It's, it's based on the information theory of the idea that uh, whenever you have any information going on, there's a signal, there's noise, and the Fitts law takes that into account. So we have the index of difficulty. This formula has gone through a lot of iterations. This one specifically is based on the Shannon uh, information theory, and simply states that for any given A, which is the amplitude of movement, so in this case it would be movement from the center to the target to uh, and the ratio of the width of the target, the two little targets. The index of difficulty, how difficult for a user, is going to be that little value. Yeah, the, one of the beauties of Fitts law is it's insanely simple. Like compared to many of the other models that come around for uh, discrete tasks, Fitts law is straightforward and honestly I was able to get it without having true grasp of uh, in-depth linear algebra. So, uh, so if using that index of difficulty, if you want to calculate the movement time, it's again straightforward. You have a plus b, which are empirically determined of coefficients, which means uh, usually when you're trying to calculate the movement time or model movement time, you have to do some empirical testing with the user on a given discrete task first to calculate the a and b. And once you do that, or you can model out further uh, movements for all uh, for all values of amplitude and width of targets based on movement time that. So if you want to calculate the movement time, you determine the, uh, the A and B, which are empirically determined, and then you can say, if I change the amplitude or if I change the width of the task, what will the possible uh, movement time for a user would be? Um, generally, it's been proven or it's been shown that it's pretty accurate. Uh, the, so the idea of Fitts law was you have to test it empirically. Like even, uh, you, you can't just say, or you could, when you determine the uh, fixed law movement time, you still have to go and do some rigorous testing, which involves A-B testing or uh, two-tail testing to figure out whether this mathematical model holds on. Yes? This is just for a single dimension of movement. This is always for a single dimension of movement, not for three. So it's, it's a discrete, discrete task for single planar movement. So, um, so what the paper does is calculates, uh, up till now, before the paper, there was not really an error model based on the Fitts law. There was this magical four percent considered that if there is a Fitts, ta Fitts law based task, there there is going to be a four percent error rate. That was just given. It. This was always empirically determined. There has been there have been a lot of studies shown to do that, and the general idea was if you have a uh, discrete task, so in in most cases a user will always the user's uh, taps or clicks or points will always have a Gauss, uh, Gaussian distribution amongst the center with about 96% being near the center and 4% being outside. Um, 
this had always really confused me as to why they had suddenly chosen four percent. So I I went back throughout all the papers that they mentioned, and um, what this said was, or what was said was, that the output or the or, or the effective target. So we have the width that we have given to the user to click, but if we look at what the user actually clicked, and we assume that to be the effective target, um, then using the information theory for which the FIST law is based on, it, it's clearly, you can see that, um, well not really clearly, but, boy did I get confused, sorry. So how did they empirically determine what the effective width would be? The idea was you take the user's taps, you calculate if, if the width was 100 pixels wide, where did the user actually click it? And based on the Gaussian distribution, it, it always came down that um, the user 96% would be within the width and the rest would usually lie outside and that would be attributed to the error rate. And they, they looked at the entropy of the information which was based on the Shannon Cotts formula and so the w dash here is the ratio of the width versus the effective width. So that's basically what they're going for. Now, from what I gathered from the paper was, they assume that let's say this four percent is accurate. If we take that, say, so if we take that four percent error rate, and we use a simple standard deviation using a unit standard deviation of one. We get a Z index that lies between negative uh, 2.066 and positive 2.066. They said, okay, we have had all this empirical evidence and we have these papers and Crossman's uh, post hoc direction that say there's always going to be about a 4% error rate. Even if there isn't, there is a reason. They said, assuming that is always correct, let's try to calculate the, uh, let's try to calculate the error model. So instead of saying that if you have a fixed law task, there will always be a 4% error rate. Let's go the other way around. Let's say there's uh, taking the four percent error rate. Can, can we model something where we, if we manipulate the movement time, can we manipulate the error model? So they try to work it out backwards. Uh, the reason that's really cool, I would like to talk about at the very end. But um, so to just bear with me, let's assume that given the information theoretic roots of its law there will always be some noise amongst the signal. So if you always have that 4% error rate, and um, that 4% comes from the idea that uh, it, when, they get, when we have entropy or information, the normal distribution is going to be that, which is based on the Shannon Claude uh, information theory, all the way back from 1940, 1950 something. Um, and if you're using that formula, and we assume that we have a standard uh, deviation of one, we will have a Z index that lies between that. So this is the, all they did in the paper was assume that to be true, put that in fixed law, and came back with an error model. Now, the, the beauty of the paper, or the beauty of this experiment that they, they, they did was they verified it empirically, which was a really cool experiment, which we will talk about as well. So um, the first thing they did was they took the movement time and they took the width that the user will have and they, uh, that the, so the width was determined by the actual apparatus of the experiment. The movement time was the one that they calculated using this law. And then they, did, they performed the simple fit experiment and they said the effective movement time, so uh, the predicted movement time was x, and, but the user actually took y, so the effective movement time would be y. And the width would be what was the area that the user actually used. So if, if let's say, um, the radius of a of the target is 50 pixels, but the user always was between uh, minus 46 and plus 46. That will be our effective width. So replacing um, the movement time with, and the width with the effective width that they actually calculated, they simply calculated that the effective width uh, would always be proportional to the amplitude of the movement over uh, two of uh, to the power of m movement time minus k over b. So again, this is real simple. Yeah. And this effective width is uh, for, for, for individual, right? For individual. So fixed law is always working on an individual basis. We basically use an individual's performance and then model out what would the general possible case be. So uh, 
using the z between negative uh, to that and that, negative to the positive two something, we basically say, all right, so our z would be uh, 2.066, uh, the width or effective width, based on the, using unit standard deviation, and with the, we substitute for effective width, again, just really simple substitutions, and so, um, now here's the correlation they made, which was, now we have the effective width that we had determined empirically. Now, if we have a, if we have a, a width, that, width of the target that the user was using, and we assume that it will always be within, there will be 4% error rate, so we can assume that the area of the target that would be underneath the, the effective width of the target would be the, the standard normal distribution, uh, and if we just integrate over minus e to plus e, so uh, we have the, uh, the standard distribution of the width, and we're only going from negative e to plus e, so using simple integration. If we combine these two, the probability of error is going to be one minus whatever the probability of hitting that target area is. So uh, using this, so these were the two really cool correlations in it. Uh, Assuming that 4% error rate is always true, you get your effective width, and then you also get your effective, uh, you calculate the error rate based on the 4% uh, standard normal distribution, and you basically just go on substitution, uh, substituting. Uh, that little part over there is a really standard mathematical error function that, it, that has been around in information theory and in discrete math for a while. Uh, replacing that with a standard error function, you simply get z over a root 2. Sub substituting for z from our very earlier equation, we get the probability of an error is 1 minus the error rate function of uh, the deviating, the, the width, the actual width of the target, the amplitude of movement, and the effective movement time. So if you look here, the cool thing is we don't care about the uh, effective width. We only care about the effective movement time. So the experiment they did, what they said, keeping everything consistent, if you're able to manipulate the effective movement time, then we should see a correlation between the error rate. So um, as a check to make sure that we're on the right track, what they also said was if you replace the effective movement time with regular, like proper movement time that the fixed was calculated, this comes down to about 4 percent point, uh, 3 point. 0.884%, so this was just a quick check that they're on sort of the right track. So, the assumptions for this derivation are really important. The first one is that fixed law holds over the movement times, uh, over a range of movement times, uh, the effective movement times, even while A and W remain unchanged. So the idea was um, there's there's two kinds of movements. There's the open movement and the open loop movements and closed loop movements. An open loop movement is when you start something and you cannot change halfway through. But a closed loop movement is where you're able to make corrections. So an example is, let's say you're moving your mouse from point A to point B, you overshoot a little bit, you can come back. But uh, an open loop would be you throw a dart. Once it's on your head, it's on your head. You can't make any corrections to it. So they assume that the fixed law will hold over a range of movement times. Uh, and in certain cases where it does not, this of course would not apply. Um, what they, uh, but they showed, or they mentioned that a bunch of other experiments have shown that even though fixed law, uh, fixed law might falter uh, in a certain uh, in certain open loop movements, it still holds relatively really well, uh, even with uh, both has, uh, hasty movements as well as deliberate movements with some sort of user base error connection involved. The other thing was there are always uh, single A and B regression coefficients, so they did not change A and B. Uh, no matter how much change the width or how much movement time, movement time change, that the error rate is only available, the one that you calculate or the one that you predict, will only be valid for those specific A and B regression coefficients. So, uh, and the final and most important one is that a user's movement will always form a uh, simple Gaussian distribution across the center of the target width. So, just a little bit of OB. So again, as I said, the paper is really simple. The most important part is you have to understand uh, that fixed law is simply a discrete task. You have something, uh, you have styles, you have some single line, you have to move your part, uh, move x to two targets of a certain way. Fixed law predicts that 
based on a specific index of difficulty, you can calculate the movement time. And a lot of prior work has shown that no matter what the fence task is, there will always be a 4% error rate. The cool thing they did, they, they assumed that if we, if we said that the 4% error rate is correct, can we predict the error rate by uh, changing the movement time separately? So, in order, so once they had this derived uh, probability of error, here's a really cool thing they did. So, if they control the movement time, does the error rate change based on the predicted error rate? If you're keeping everything else same, instead of predicting the movement time, should we, uh, if we control the movement, effective movement time, can we change the error rate? Uh, so the experiment was a really simple one, controlled the target size. So there was a target thing that they had to grab between a target distance, which was also manipulated, and movement time that they manipulated in a single one-dimensional task. So think of like pointing your mouse somewhere. Uh, pretty a decent experiment, decent sized experiments. There were 12 target acquisitions for three different target sizes for 16 pixels, uh, 32 pixels, and 64 pixels for three different target distances. So, and so that means that they did three times three target acquisitions, um, three times three times 12 target acquisitions um, for, and they did ran the experiment twice. So that was a total of 216 discrete fixed tasks per user for 16 participants. So um, what the way they did it was because one of the uh, assumptions is the AI and the regression coefficients have to remain the same. So uh, instead of just fixing an AI and coefficient, they wanted to do it per user so that they're able to uh, look at a user's fixed, uh, a user's error rate uh, across different age ranges and across different as so what is fast for someone might be slow for someone else. So what they did was they did it in two phases. The first one was a calibration phase, where uh, it was a really simple conventional fits uh, reciprocal pointing task. So this was the 12 accusations. Uh, conditions were repeated twice, as, as I said before. And the, cool, uh, the thing that they forced was they have to maintain a 4% error rate. So if a user didn't actually get a 4% error rate, they were asked to perform the task again, so that the error rate was about 4%-ish. And the error rate was shown after each, uh, each uh, iteration of the task. And only the ones with the 4% error rate were, were taken into account. And with the effective movement time and the width and the target of the manipulator, they were able to calculate the A and B coefficients empirically. So if you go back to the uh, Fitz Law task, or Fitz Law formula, if you have the movement time and the A and the blue plus 1, you were able to calculate, uh, empirically determine the A and B coefficients. They don't really go into much detail exactly how they did it, but the source code is available. Yes. How did they control the effective movement time? That's the cool part. That's, that's what I love about this experiment. So, so once they had the information they needed, what they did was they had visual and auditory metronome used to manipulate participants' time. So, uh, instead of the user just having all the time to move, they were given an audio signal that they had to move in time. And if they did not, if they were not able to perform it in time, it was counter as an error. So, uh, so when a target saw that, okay, it's time for me to click the left or the right stick, they had a certain uh, limited movement time. If they did not do it, then that was counted as an error. And the users knew what Yeah, they were, they were told exactly what they were doing. close to it. 
because the um, the error rates at the when the predicted error rate was low and the observed error rate was also low, they're they're a um, bit off. Uh, what's the word? Sorry, uh, they're not exactly on the scale that they predicted it. But if you average out the error rates on uh, each level of the empty percent, then you start to see a much better understanding of, or then you start to see a much better correlation, yeah, that our predictor formula works uh, if you start to average up. Because anything that involves um, user tasks, you can't use individual bits. You have to get a lot of different entries and try to combine them or try to average them out just to be able to see. Because we're not trying to predict every little movement. We're trying to predict what the possibility is or what, what the user will uh, what are the chances of user doing it? So um, the other interesting part of the experiment was Pixel predicts that the uh, target width and the amplitude of movements are pretty, the ratio of that is pretty one to one. That's it. One, uh, the width doesn't actually, uh, is more important than the amplitude. But the experiment found that uh, the target width uh, had a lot more effect on the error rate uh, than predicting by Pixel. For larger target bits, uh, the effective area was way underutilized. For uh, smaller target bits, the uh, the areas were overutilized, even within the same level of the next difficulty. So um, that that was the, one of the interesting experiments, and then they put it down to saying that simply means fit slot isn't perfect. Like, it's been around since 1954. A lot of work has been done on it, but still we're learning more things. And so. The other thing was, what was the use of predicting this error law? Uh, predicting this error rate based on the fixed law. The error prediction can be as useful as time prediction, um, especially in cases, uh, a good example that McCroft gave me was, you have more features. Um, usually, you will never see a, a IV drip that has like a proper numpad, because people mess up a lot of time pressing like the point through one, and if you give someone you don't press the point, you have a kill location. That's why often with uh, IV drinks, you will see like big buttons that go up and down to one little increment. So in cases where you need an emergency button, you can use this fix law and this error rate to figure out, okay, how big do I need to make a button so that the chance that a user will mess up accidentally picking it is really, really low. Fitz's original intention for using this law was for the air aircraft cockpits. Let's see, I'm really familiar with them. He was, I'm not sure if he was enough for it or uh, he was really interested in talking. So the idea was there are important buttons that need to be pressed at a certain time. Uh, we can use this error prediction model to, pick, uh, to set it up so that the chance that a user will pop up is really low. So that's it. The presentation is really simple. I can that dance. So uh, I'm still a bit confused about um, I guess where the magical four percent comes came from yeah, in so the original. Yeah, so that took me a while to understand as well. I guess I should have gone over it. it is it? Um, so um, the idea is, this law comes from the uh, uh, Claude Shannon information theory, and that the way the fixed law the fixed initially model the law was based on if you think of uh, the movement as signal. Think of the amplitude as a as, as signal in, in an information theory medium, the error rate is just the noise that, that is being produced. That's, that's what the general idea is based on. So, um, but the, uh, so the, okay, so just to be clear, the amplitude. Amplitude is the user's movement. Okay, so like, like the, the position at a given point in time, or, so, or like yeah. how far they need to go? Yeah, so amplitude would be if the user, if that light, uh, light on the left lights up, the user has to move this out from the center here to somewhere on the target. So if that's, that's yeah. if that's 10 centimeters away, then the amplitude for this task is 10 centimeters? Uh, the amplitude is calculated based on the center of the target. Okay. So that's but sure, but I mean, like, yeah. that's, it's, then, it's for like that particular s experimental setup. Yes would have, uh, you know, if, if the centers are 20 centimeters apart, mm -hmm. like that, yeah. the amplitude is 10 centimeters or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then, 
So for a particular experimental setup, you've got a specific amplitude that doesn't change and a width that doesn't change, yes. and that gives you the index of difficulty. Yes. And then, uh, and then, is it so the the four percent error rate? Um, uh, I I can I can kind of see how that correlates to noise with the signal of the task, uh, but I guess is it is it because of just like the choices that humans make about how fast yeah, it's, to it's, go? It's just about uh, how how people move, move around. Because if, if they chose, to, if they're given all the time in the world and they chose to be really careful yeah, about so it, the, that's, that's but they just about. tend not to, I guess? Um, no, they, the thing is, if you give them all the time in the world, the error rate will be approximately zero. But uh, so, fixed log in, only models rapid movement. That, that's the first thing. Uh, okay. um, in So, generally, it's been shown uh, that there's two ways to account for uh, a lack, like low error rate. Um, one is, well, if the effective movement time of a user is less than 0.6 percent, 0.6 percent of the um, determined movement, determined movement time, this lot is really old. So let's say let's okay. say let's say the this lot predicts that you will take one millisecond or uh, one second to move uh, from point A to point B. Yeah. But if you uh, if the effective movement time of the user is is less than 0.6 percent of that of the predicted one, so if it's less than 600 milliseconds, then the fixed lot will. Okay. So um, if, if that's the case, uh, the, the so it makes certain assumptions about how yeah, the, how how people are going to choose to yes. behave. Yeah. Yes, that's that's one of the parts. Um, they do mention a bunch of other things uh, where if you have a far more deliberate movement, where instead of so if you look here, the um, over here for the slot, it's it's logarithmic based on the amplitude and with the movement time changes logarithmic. There have been other models proposed where if you take into account the slowness of a user's movement, uh, the, uh, the movement time can increase in there. So in cases like those, you will use a slightly different model. So that, that's, that's one of the things with ATI. There's a lot of models. They do mention quite a few competing ones. I chose to not mention them because uh, honestly, I'm not that familiar with the other ones. But they do mention that if you have uh, different conditions where your task requires uh, it is slower than rapid movement, you might want to use a model that that uses that increases linearly uh, versus other linearly. Yeah. Um, I've heard Fitzlaw used to describe why the corners of the screen are the most valuable pieces of real estate, and um, it was like uh, because they're the easiest parts of the screen to hit. Is it? Is that because the width of the target at that point is essentially like if I hit, if I uh, bounce my mouse up to the corner, uh, is the width essentially infinite? Is no, the, in, in that case, it's not really infinite. But the okay. idea is, I mean, you, you you could say that you, you can uh, it, you can assume it as a, uh, as an open loop movement where you're just pulling your mouse. Mm -hmm. The reason the corners are super important are because unlike a stylus, your mouse isn't going to fly away. If the user knows that they, they, they they're they're expecting that mouse will take like X amount of time to go, so they can blindly just go, go far and click, rather than in, in case of this task, and the user's like, oh, boom, they're gonna go way farther ahead. But that's sort of what I mean. Is like, is the target's width at that point almost infinite? Yeah, you you, you can consider it, but then I, I don't see that in fitting as a fixed lock model. Is okay. where well, the impact would be.
about what A and B specifically mean, but is that an interpretation that A would be the reaction time and B is kind of like the stopping around the target time? And that, that's why B is the only one being affected by the fixed law, mm -hmm. such that that's the only time that start the is the only one being affected by the index of difficulty, yes. So like that's what A and B are meant to represent? Like uh, the starting with that's going to be ending with that's, that. that's how they chose to use it in the experiment that they did. Yeah, it seems because it seems like uh, the log two, like everything after the a plus b, uh, well, the index of difficulty, it seems is like you know you're dividing the amplitude by the width, so you end up with something that is not dependent on any absolute yes. distances. Th but then, the like when you multiply, like the lowercase b that you're multiplying by. It seems like the kinds of variables that that would take into account is like the like how fast humans are human arms move across whatever distance it actually is in the experimental setup, yep. and also like maybe how the person is sitting because then they would go you know like who, who knows what different things might. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about this one, but one of the other uh, if you pick up you can go on the Instagram account. So you're saying A would change in that case and not, so not B? So for each of your empirical setup, you will have to come with the A and B. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 The, the, the general uh, place where it fits, well, it is really, uh, fits in really well is you can, um, because the, uh, we don't really care about the actual amplitude or the actual width, we care about the ratio. You can take a lot of different uh, setups and you can compare them. So, uh, like, like for example, if, if you, so if you're just trying to find out uh, what the best case scenario for uh, moving between two things in this case, is going, maybe you, what the only thing you care about is what's the minimal width I need to make, I need to have, so the user doesn't look like okay. it. So, 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 so you, for example, have a specific distance in between the amplitude is given for you, yeah. and then you try to find out the minimal width. Not the minimal width of that. Because in device design, like mm -hmm. from mechanical engineering, it's yes. uh, yeah, that's what sometimes you have physical limitations. Yes. limitations yes. Um, yeah, that's one, again, so that's one of the reasons I kind of chose this paper. One, it's really, really simple. If, if you start reading it, it, you can just go through it, like, mostly understand it. But at the same time, it's really information dense. Like, if you want to go into the theory, and if you want to, uh, the two papers that, uh, the citation number 17 and the citation number 29, that come in a lot of times, if you just go read those papers, those are far more detailed. Uh, the, so number, I think this was number 19. It's a lot of research and design tool. This was written by the same professor with some of the collaborators back in 1992. And that's, this is the paper where they uh, came up with this variation of its law, where it's log of a log of 2a over n plus 1, um, based on the Lukacian theorem. Before that, most of the variations that law didn't um, at a plus 1 over n. So there have been a lot of variations that, have, that suit different uh, ca uh, categories of animal material. This one, uh, the reason they're using this one is because they found uh, this model fits a pointing task really well. So if you want to, even if you, if you change from a mouse pointer to a stylus, you might want to use a slightly different variation of this one, uh, where you can a slightly uh, different variation of index the next but in the way that it fits long.
Gates himself did a lot of experiments, um, and there have been a lot of studies just using his data and trying to find out uh, where it fits in. So if you
other questions? Does this factor into anything? Does it bring into anything, say, if somebody's designing a mobile app? Yeah. That would, should somebody really spend time to really optimize this level of detail? Um, okay, okay, so, so one, 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 example, one example to give is if you're looking at a planning task. Uh, so the, let's say you're a game designer. You, you can use something like this to model how quickly the leaves are going to look. Uh, if, you, if, you have, uh, if you have something like uh, the Apple where it's a lot of pointing, mm -hmm. you can figure out, okay, if this is a dungeon, uh, you can kind of estimate. The user will say, you'll have, the user will have to click this a bunch of time to move here. So you can, if, if you want to go into really detail, you can have a really uh, customized or really, uh, really good progression where it's not frustrating the user, but it's still challenging. Very by individual user. Yes, so they, they will have to target like a certain range of users. For them. They'll have to target a certain range of users. So they'll have to say, okay, uh, we're targeting 20 to 25 years old, which is our main target market, and the usual move in this range. Unless you actually have a dynamic. Game. Well, yeah. As I said, like, you can use a, a model like this uh, to be as detailed or as, as simple as you want. On the other side, I can see easily that. UI can scale up and down, and uh, I mean button sizes, for example, to a certain extent yes. by learning from this algorithm. Right? Yes. And, and especially when you miss the button, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of timer that button actually considered pressed. Yes. That also um, can be there, very. There was another experiment he did with um, on screen keyboards in Zilai where um, they, they tested uh, buttons as to what size is the optimal button for error rates. Yes. Like the, there have been a lot of experiments like that. Now, if you want to just because I always missing stuff. I, mean, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I mean, problem. I thought that my fingers too wide or something. But, but that's also <laughs> interesting, right? Because in most online people, they they seem to be all different on button sizes. Yes, they really should be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and when you press it, you say, you know, you press the wrong one, right? You do, what yeah, do you yeah, do yeah. now? Yeah. You, you, can, you can also look at oh. it. Um, I mean, the, uh, the iOS keyboard, they look like they're the same sizes, but actually they, like, the effective, the, t the actual target size yeah, is different um, based on what they expect. So, like, that's, if... That's also for yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like, um, if you go, there's, uh, there's a whole paper on um, what keys are pressed most, and he, he has English, there's a whole uh, free available tool where you can throw a dictionary at it, It'll spit out which words appear, uh, how much, and in percentages, and you can figure out okay, if I'm designing a keyboard, how big you want it to make certain things. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you.